Hey church family, we hope that meditating on the cross of Christ with the help of these videos this week have borne fruit in your life this holy week. And today is Good Friday. And on Good Friday, we're gonna consider the access to God that the cross provides. And we must remember, especially those of us who have been Christians for a long time, that access to God is not a given. Maybe we've grown up in a tradition where access to God is something assumed or it's something that we always know, oh, I can, I can, I can talk to God about this at a certain point. Well, let's take a step back. First, God is creator and we're his creation. And so the idea that we could access God should be something that fills us with fear. In Isaiah, God says, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. We are his creation. He is the creator. We should not assume we could walk up to the creator and just be able to speak with him and be able to converse with him and relate to him. First off, there's that huge disparity between creator and creature. But then second, and this is something we might be more aware of on a day-to-day -day basis, we're inherently sinful. And he can accept no sin. Habakkuk uh, 1 even says, you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. So that's a problem. And it's a problem that God's people throughout history would be consistently reminded of. You think of Exodus, um, the tabernacle. You think of the temple uh, from First Chronicles. And in that is two different concepts. One is that God does want to dwell with his people. He chose to dwell with his people in an astounding act of mercy. His creation and his chosen people rebelled against him, but he still wanted to dwell with them, even though consistently they would go after other gods, but he chose to dwell with them. And so he did so in a tabernacle and then later in a temple. And there's a sacrifice system and a priestly uh, service that needs to be rendered. So yes, he's dwelling with his people, but access to God is pretty limited. Exodus 26 talks about the curtain in the tabernacle that uh, separated the tabernacle. So the tabernacle was fenced off from the rest of the town um, and the, uh, the curtains themselves, very specific instructions on how thick they're supposed to be very thick. How many curtains? How many rings? Um, so Exodus 26 just runs down what God is saying must happen for him to dwell with them. And there's this idea of this thick, heavy curtain that brings separation, but also makes it so that God's people are able to dwell alongside their God, that he dwells with them in a special way. Um, and then in Exodus 36, Moses carries that out. And so then the temple, there's the Holy of Holies, there's the separation. And only once a year, once a year, the, uh, the high priest could enter in and make sacrifices on behalf of his people. And God wouldn't always accept those sacrifices. Um, God's presence would destroy people. God is not to be trifled with. He is holy. And that's a good thing. We need God to be holy. We need God not to look at wrong. But the problem is not only are we creatures and he's creation, but we're sinful. And so this curtain, this access to God that was so restricted and so cut off this one time a year, we were making sacrifices for sin and all of these rules, God's people had a consistent idea of what access to God was like. They were grateful that the Ark of the Covenant was there. Um, but God showed them over and over again, you cannot trifle with my presence. He is holy. And so that's why it's so significant that Matthew and Mark and Luke, when Jesus dies and he breathes his last, tells the Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This curtain separating God's presence from the rest of his people inside the Holy of Holies, inside the temple, that is ripped in two from top to bottom. Only God could have done this. And so because Jesus was sent and Jesus died, we have Emmanuel, God with us, and we can approach him and not only approach him, but we're told to approach him several points in the scriptures boldly, 
approach his throne boldly. We are sons and daughters. So we just we don't just have an appointment uh, to be able to talk to God more than once a year and not fear for our lives. No, because of Christ, we have a relationship with God the Father. We have an ability to go to him again and again with our needs. Uh, in Hebrews 4, it, it calls that throne, the throne of grace, where we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our passage uh, is Hebrews 10 and says, and starting in verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. So notice that confidence is already there. That's provided for us. We can approach the throne of grace with confidence to enter the holy places, even the most holy places, by the blood of Jesus. That's what we remember today. If it was not for the blood of Jesus, there would be no way, no way we could access God, access God the Father, be able to speak Him, find mercy and grace to help in time of need, know Him as nothing but um, a judge, that has a sentence over us. No, because of Christ and because of what he did 2,000 years ago, we have confidence to enter the throne of grace. How do we do that? By the blood of Jesus, verse 20, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain. That's the curtain I was talking about. And the rip through that curtain from top to bottom was Jesus creating a new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Amen. Let us do that today. We have access to the throne of grace through the blood of Christ. And we can cry, Abba, Father.